Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is going to be the last uh, mini lecture before the midterms. Uh, this is class uh, 27, somehow. Um, the future of global climate governance. And today we're going to be talking about the articles from Dreisick and from Manuel Wainwright to think about not only the question of what will what might global governance look like in the, in the future changing climate, but also why it matters for questions of global justice. So here we're going to be ta introducing the idea and talking a little bit about procedural justice before we talk about the kind of arguments for uh, democratic climate governance, the concerns around climate leviathan that Mann and Wainwright raise, and all finally, uh, Dreisick's argument for reflexive institutions of global governance. So what is procedural justice? Um, we can start by distinguishing it from both corrective and distributive justice, where corrective justice deals with repairing an injustice and distributive justice focus on how the benefits and burdens of society are allocated. Procedural justice uh, is a, an evaluation of how decisions are made within a society. This is closer to what Jung is talking about, injustice and the politics of difference. And the idea here is that you want to have fair participa participation or representation. Um, in the decision making. So this can often procedural justice, um, like we saw with like Rawls's original position or with Young's account of justice as fair, uh, justice and the politics of difference. Uh, there's like kind of an argument that procedural justice is a prerequisite for distributive justice, but it's also t potentially a good in and of itself. So why should we care about procedural justice? Well, we can think about it uh, instrumentally, that fair procedures are going to ensure better outcomes, that people are more likely to comply if they think the decision was made in a fair way. So if you're interested in kind of an effective global climate regime, you want it to be perceived as fair so that people comply with it. On the other hand, you might think that procedural justice is a good and even in and of itself, that having fair procedures is just, that justice demands having fair procedures, even if it creates inefficiencies. And so we might base this on something like the all affected principle, that all those who are affected by a decision should have to should be able to participate in making that decision, or at the very least have their views represented in decision making, that laws are unjust if they are if you are obliged to follow them but have no way to participate in their formation. So this matters in the context of climate change because there are many people who have argued that we need to put democracy on hold to deal with the crisis, the size of the uh, of climate change. The Earth System Science James Lovelock, um, who came up with the Gaia hypothesis that you may or may not be familiar with, gave an interview in The Guardian in 2010 and argued that in the context of climate change, that we need a more authoritative, not authoritarian, uh, of world that we need stronger forms of authority that just can't happen in a democracy. He argues that we need. I have a feeling that the climate issue may be an issue as severe as a war. It may be necessary to put democracy on hold for a little while. And so we might think that there are some arguments for what people have called technocratic climate governance. Um, that, that we need. We should empower experts uh, and empower. Give them the authority to kind of just make decisions for the best of us, rather than democratic decisions. On the one hand, superior, their superior knowledge, as we know, climate change is a complex. Even the science itself uh, is complex. The IPCC's fifth assessment working, uh, reports working group on the scientific basis of climate change is 1,500 pages long. The technical summary is 84 pages. Um, and, and when we talk about climate policy, we're also talking about the interaction between physical, chemical, ecological, social, political, economic systems all over the globe over many years, decades, and even centuries. So not only is it difficult, but there's also the concern that non-expert populations could be manipulated by demagogues or misinformation, that the kind of debates around climate denial and climate misinformation prove that we, sh that we uh, it, it is too the, the democratic publics are liable to be misled, and so we should instead empower experts. When we're also talking about just the scale and scope of the problem, that responding to climate change will require significant and potentially fundamental changes to the way that we've organized social and political systems. Uh, and we need to have may ensure that that, ha that that transition happens effectively. And, even, and there's going to be vested interests in keeping the status quo and not transforming these systems. And therefore, we can't allow democratic debate here. We need to kind of move quickly, um, that we're contemplating just like a massive type of transformation. Uh, democratic deliberations take time, and this is 
on purpose. The idea behind democratic deliberation and decision making is to ensure that all voices are heard and incorporated. Um, and that's usually taken as a virtue. But many climate scientists and the IPCC, they contend that the window of opportunity to take effective measures on climate change is going to close in the next decade. So perhaps we don't have time to convince everyone in the United States to take climate change seriously. Finally, there's a question of feasibility. Simply put, global democracy doesn't exist, um, that we do not have a global democratic forum, and building these types of institutions will take even longer. So rather than trying to build a figure out how we would have a global democracy, we should empower global governance institutions that can take swift action now using the systems that are already in place. So what might this look like? Um, one proposal that's gotten a lot of traction is this idea of a planetary boundary uh, referee. Um, uh, climate scientists uh, Will Steffen, Johan Rockström, and Robert Costanza, they draw on the idea of planetary boundaries um, as, and this is research done by, about, uh, that they've done uh, with other collaborators, that there are basically certain thresholds in environmental quality, including um, biodiversity, uh, land use patterns, uh, global freshwater availability, ocean acidification, stratospheric ozone depletion, um, the cli climate change, etc. cetera, uh, that there are certain limits within which um, the human populations can survive, live both effectively and, 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 and flourish. Um, but the, the, the planetary boundaries, once we overshoot these boundaries, once we move um, beyond this kind of safe operating zone and we start moving out here, then these threaten human habitation. So what we need instead is, they, they argue, is a global referee that would be the ultimate arbiter of the myriad trade-offs that need to be managed. Uh, the global referee on a global planetary playing field, um, one proposed direction is the Earth Atmospheric Trust, which would treat the atmosphere as a global common, sorry, as a global common property asset managed as a trust for the benefit of current and future uh, uh, generations. So the idea here is that you would empower some global governance institution to basically say, like, nope, that pol that policy needs to be stricken down, or this this these changes need to be made, and you and, and give them the enforcement capacity to ensure that. Um, so they could kind of manage policy around the world to ensure that their uh, greenhouse gas mitigations happen. So this is kind of one proposal, but proposals like this raise lots of questions and concerns for people. And so um, in their, their essay, um, Climate Leviathan, Mann and Wainwright talk about say that we need to kind of invert the the normal era that we talk about. Usually we talk about the impacts of politics on climate change, but they argue that we need to think about how the changing climate was going to impact our politics and the possibilities for a just and democratic response to climate change. And so they argue that the future of politics on a warming planet is going to be um, driven by two questions. The first is, um, Will capitalism continue to be the dominant form of economic organization? Uh, they argue basically, will the MCM uh, uh, form of uh, wealth acquisition um, continue? Uh, this is the idea of MCM being that you, uh, the, as in contrasted with a more traditional economic view where you would first have a commodity, you would sell that commodity for money, and then you would buy more commodities. Uh, with capitalism, you have the shift to you have capital, use that capital to hire people to uh, produce commodities, which you then sell for more capital, and then you can reinvest this capital back into your starting point, and it creates this continual cycle of capital accumulation. Don't worry too much about that. Um, but they argue that, like, what, what will capitalism survive climate change, or will there be a transition to something like a socialism or communism or some other form of economic formulation? So that's one question. And the second question that they ask is, will we have a global government or not? Will sovereignty still be at the level of the nation state or not? Um, and so again, here we're talking about this question of sovereignty, who has the ultimate form of authority, uh, and will this continue to be at the nation state level or at the global level? And from these two questions, we get four possible futures, according to Mann and Wainwright, of what global politics might look like. Um, and whether we will have a capitalist planetary sovereign, which they call a climate leviathan, a capitalist anti-planetary capitalist system without a global government, which they call climate behemoth, an anti-capitalist global government that they call climate Mao, and an anti-capitalist anti-global government system, which they leave open as a radical possibility or climate X.
So let's talk about these in form. The first one is Climate Leviathan, and this is the creation of a global authority that can make decisions on behalf of all life on Earth. And they argue that would base, this would be the expansion of the UNFCCC into a global body with coercive authority um, that would probably but would still be dominated by the market democracies in the global north. Basically, what they argue is that we will not be able that the, the persistence of global capitalism will mean that we will be unable to take aggressive mitigation policies. Um, and instead, we will shift towards adaptation which will create a, a constant state of emergency, and the state of emergency is going to allow for the creation of more and more uh, coercive authority at the global level. And, and under Climate Leviathan, they argue that, um, that capitalism will be viewed as the solution. So rather than uh, kind of questioning uh, growth or trying to like reform the kind of economic system, that this, the Climate Leviathan will try to manage the crisis through um, various carbon pricing and, and financial instruments. Um, and and the, the trick here is that this will be democratically legitimated because of the state of emergency that will be so scared of the terrible impacts of climate change that we will all vote for an anti-democratic global government. Um, and so we will create this climate leviathan, just like Hobbes says we will create a leviathan out of the state of war. Take my other class if you're interested in that question. The other possibility is what he calls climate Mao. Um, or what they call climate Mao, which is what they call a revolution, a revolutionary anti-capitalist authority. That the goal is still a global planetary sovereign, but they are identify capitalism as the problem, not the solution, and they appeal to kind of Maoist communist theory. That they replace liberal procedural justice with rapid state-led transformation, um, and they identifies the need for rapid action and the fail, but argues that liberal democracies are what's the problem and that we need to have a kind of authoritarian anti-capitalist system. Um, and this is, this is they, they argue that this is a path out of, um, out of Asia where there are large vulnerable populations to climate change and existing strong state capacities. Um, and so you have a kind of like a shift in the balance of power to China and other, uh, other states. And they argue that this will this this will look like the rapid rise of more authoritarian state socialisms, regimes that use their power to rapidly reduce global climate emission, global carbon emissions, and maintain control during climate induced emergencies. So it has all the power of climate leviathan, but it works, but it's a kind of an anti-capitalist movement. Climate behemoth is the reaction, is what they argue is the kind of reaction of capitalist elites against global sovereignty. This kind of resistance to giving up the nation state, but desire to hold on to capitalism, especially within financial elites in Western Europe and North America. This can be seen in climate denialism, market liberalism, the emphasis on individual freedom. All of these are given as reasons to reject planetary sovereignty. We can also see this in populist movements in the United States, everything from Alex Jones conspiracy theories, Koch funded climate denialism, uh, the, Trump, uh, the Trump's election in 2016, all as kind of this kind of resistance in the name of global capitalism to any sort of climate governing, governing body. Um, so this is kind of challenge to uh, climate leviathan from within. Now, the last box in their matrix is what they call Climate X, um, and this is democratic struggles for climate justice. And they don't really tell us what this looks like. Um, they say that only in a world that is no longer organized by the value form and only where sovereignty has become the, so deformed that the political can no longer be organized by the sovereign exception, is it possible to imagine a just response to climate change? So something where this is simultaneously a resistance to cap global capitalism and a resistance to authoritarian state power and some form of affirmation of climate justice and popular freedom. But we don't really know what this is. And in, the, in a longer book of the same name, Climate Leviathan, that was published uh, in 2016, or, uh, sorry, 2018, um, they are, Men and Wainwright argue, they look towards indigenous uh, forms of, so, uh, 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 indigenous politi political theory, indigenous forms of sovereignty to try to argue for what this might look like, but it's still very, very schematic. And part of the reason why they, why they don't tell us what this would look like is because they don't think that we can theorize this. They think that this is going to actually emerge, that practice is going to come before theory here, that where this is going to emerge through actual activist struggles for climate justice and the types of political or form formulations that will come out of that, those struggles. So we're going to talk about Dreisek's kind of alternative uh, way of thinking about global governance in just a second. But if you need to take a break, now would be a good time to do so.
Okay, so Mann and Wainwright paint us this kind of depressing picture um, where three of the four kind of possibilities are not great. Um, we either have anti-democratic capitalism and global authoritarianism, anti-capitalist global authoritarianism, or capitalist anti-global governance kind of nation-based authoritarianism. Um, they think personally um, that the, um, that climate leviathan here is the most likely outcome. Um, they argue that like we're already kind of seeing this with the way that the UNFCCC works and the way that kind of like uh, various uh, capital that capitalism is trying to maneuver itself as the solution to the climate crisis. Um, but they argue that it's not yet a kind of done deal. Um, so that there's there's still lots of resistances uh, from climate behemoth to even take climate change seriously, as well as um, kind of challenges from alternate models of political economic organization. Now, Dreisig, in the article that you read for today, takes a different approach and argues that he's not trying to speculate kind of the what was likely to happen. He's trying to give us a bit more of an insight of what this might look like. And he's not really answering the question of capitalism per se, um, but he's trying to say, like, well, what would, a what would just global political institutions to climate change look like? So can we have this climate X plus, you know, the global governance of climate, global governance without climate leviathan. And he argues that we have to take seriously the idea that the Anthropocene is different than the Holocene, that the conditions of life on Earth and therefore of politics are different now than they were when the nation state and market capitalism kind of emerged. And so we need to kind of shift the way we think about ecological politics, that rather than thinking that we usually think about environmental politics as this idea that there are certain ecological limits to political and economic development, this kind of planetary boundaries that I talked about earlier. Um, but they argue, or, or Dreisig argues, that in the Anthropocene, ecosystems are not just external constraints on human activity. We are not just in the system, we also help drive its parameters. So what makes the Anthropocene different is the lack of fixed reference points for collective action given by the desirable state of key systems, and that includes planetary boundaries. The, the idea behind the Anthropocene is that the planetary boundaries are not given, but they're being shaped by our own activity. And that constant, that means that we have to think about environmental politics in a much more dynamic sense, that the very kind of limits to what are politically and economically feasible and sustainable aren't kind of given in advance. We can't, aren't, aren't like written in nature, but are constantly changing. And this means that we need to develop new types of institutions. Um, and so he, they, he argues, um, and with his co-author Jonathan Pickering in a book version of this, The Politics of the Anthropocene, um, that we need to, that right now, we have what are called pathological institutions, that we've kind of become locked into certain institutions like global capitalism, like the sovereign states, that these same types of institutions are, are both unable to respond to climate change effectively, as we have seen, but also have precipitated uh, climate change. Um, but because we've kind of taken these we, through history, through institutional inertia, through power, relationships of power, um, we've become locked into these institutions and it's hard for us to kind of reform them So instead, and, and, and respond to the challenges of climate change. So instead we need what, they call, what he calls reflexive institutions. Uh, and reflexivity, he defines as the, content, the ability to be the self-critical capacity of a structure or process or set of ideas to change itself after a scrutiny of its own failures or successes. Reflexivity entails a capacity to be something different rather than just do something different. So we need institutions that can transform themselves, that are dynamic and flexible, not just to kind of adapt to, but literally transform themselves as these social economic, these pair or coupled social ecological systems but, uh, that he talks about in, in, in the Anthropocene, as these continue to transform in potentially unpredictable ways over the coming centuries. So we need to create new ways of thinking about governance. That these are going to, we need uh, institutions that can respond to and revise in light of feedback from the changing Earth system. So what, what does reflexivity mean? They, in, 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 a book, in the longer version of this argument in the book, The Politics of the Anthropocene, Dreisig and Pickering break it in, into three parts. Um, listening, or sorry, recognition, response, and reflection. So like reduce, reuse, recycle, but 
differ. Uh, recognition, they argue, involves listening for changes in social ecological systems, so like being kind of attentive to how these systems are changing, monitoring impacts, um, but also anticipating future conditions and impacts. So doing kind of good scientific modeling, trying to figure out what the world's going to look like in the future. This then requires responding. Uh, so how are we going to re-articulate and re uh, reconfigure institutions and uh, re uh, institutional functions and rules and practices and re-articulate core aims, values, discourses, ideas, principles? But also, after we do this and respond, we also need to engage in processes of reflection, learning from past successes and failures, rethinking these core values and, and practices, and envisioning possible, possible futures so that we can better um, because if we don't engage in this process of reflection here, we're not going to be able to recognize um, these changes here. And if we don't recognize these changes here, we're not going to be able to respond here. And so this is a kind of constant cycle that each one is necessary to the next step here. So they argue um, that, that this does, again, you're likely to be frustrated by the answer that is given here, but this is this idea of reflexivity means that we cannot determine in advance like what the institutional structure of a just global governance system would look like we can't we can't know like oh well you would have a global parliament with this principle of representation that meets in this way that is organized by this rules um they argue that we have to that we can't that, that would violate the principles of reflexivity to develop a model of a democratic global governance that instead what we need to do is to start from where we are and to look at kind of existing global institutions, look at the UNFCCC, look at the IPCC, look at trans bilateral to climate uh, and environmental treaties, look at um, the way that global trade is works, look at global financing, look at the way that the nation state system and identify possibilities of institutional change and opportunities for introducing more reflexivity in existing institutions. So do our current policy responses to climate change allow for things like experimentation, deliberation, contestation, and revision? Or are they kind of like a one-size-fits-all uh, policy option? In the book, they do give us some concrete, some more concrete practical advice. Uh, they argue for dismantling barriers to reflexivity. Um, and so looking at the ways, that, and this can be anything from uh, looking at the way that corporate, finan corporate financing for elections happens in democracies, um, to changing the way that decision making is made in order to, uh, in order to, um, in, in order to encourage more voices, but also changing the infrastructure, uh, the political and social infrastructure, the political, uh, sorry, the material and economic infrastructures to allow for better attunement to the environment. That we need to avoid renewed lock-in. Um, so we need to, they argue in the book that now that the costs of renewable resources are falling, we need to make large-scale investment in um, CCS technology and for electricity gender, uh, generation in renewable way um, so that we don't kind of fall back into fossil fuels, especially now, given the global coronavirus pandemic, that oil prices are collapsing. We also need to find ways to introduce reflexivity into, an, into existing institutions, whether including public inquiries that allow for more people to engage in public policy decision making, independent review bodies that review regulations, uh, and institutionalizing procedural environmental rights, the ability for ordinary people to contest um, that their environmental rights are being violated build in mandated attention to ecological concerns into like a uh, review process of our legislation, having requirements for periodic review of reflex uh, of legislation and laws and policies so that they are being, they can be changed and updated regularly, sunset clauses for legislation and policies that, um, that encourage so that, you know, no one policy is kind of just sitting there um, preventing future change and reflexivity, um, as well as they have some more radical proposals, such as appointing custodians in legislatures for um, future generations and for non-humans that kind of speak on behalf of these unrepresented voices, uh, linking citizens with Earth, building a kind of global public sphere that links citizens with, Earth, with uh, climate scientists and experts, uh, engaging in more policy experimentation, creating a global dissent channel that allows citizens from around the world to participate and express their 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 opinions in global policy making electoral reform at the nation state level to ensure that more uh, people are able to vote um, so and so this is everything for, uh, uh, um, from uh, from empowering younger people 
Um, but they also and, and they, they also suggest potentially weighting individuals vote by their average life expectancy for their age um, to um, give people more say when they have more at stake in the issue, which is kind of a pretty controversial reform. Um, and, and and changing the way we think about education. So to, um, so uh, include making more courses about for about critical thinking and and public policy and environmental politics. So courses like this one. So that's it for today. Um, the next class is the exam. So there won't be a recorded lecture. There also won't be a discussion section for Friday. So I want, I don't want to, kind of, I will have my normal office hours if you have questions about the exam, um, but I don't want to take your time away from writing the exam. So this will be available Friday morning and it, you have until Sunday at, at midnight to submit the exam. Again, you answer four of the provided six short answer questions. These questions, your answers should be between 200 to 400 words. Uh, I won't, I'm not going to like be super rigorous in policing this, but like if you are writing five, six, 700 words for your essays, it's not fair for me to evaluate that against some, uh, someone else's who's are shorter. Uh, as it says in their instructions, you should cite sources parenthetically from the reading. Uh, you can cite class notes just like class 26 or something like that. Um, so that you um, you are expected to cite sources since it is an open note and open book quiz, uh, exam. And you should upload your file to Moodle in a doc or docx file so that I can easily read it. And my pets wish you the best of luck. So that for the discussion thread for today, um, there's two options. Um, you can either uh, talk about which of Mann and Wainwright's four futures you believe is most likely to occur, explain and defend your answer. Or you can, if you want to, if more interested in Dreisek's article, describe reflexivity in your own words and describe one way that policymakers, international negotiators, climate scientists, and or activists could introduce more reflexivity into global governance institutions. So with that, uh, I will wish you best of luck on the, on the midterm, and I will see you next week. As always, and send me an email if you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, if you're curious about any of this material and you want more detail. If you just want to say hi, stop by into office hours. Um, let me know if there's anything else I can do to help you guys learn this material. Good luck on the exam, and I'll see you next week. Take care now.